Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. All right, switching it up for the next couple of weeks um, from John Middlecoff to Hoops Tonight lead guy, uh, Jason Timp, who has, uh, we're so proud of Jason because not only does he kick ass and work his butt off, but uh, when we landed him, we thought he was really good and we couldn't believe he didn't have a larger audience. And soon enough, he's got a larger audience and he does a great job, has grown a wicked mustache <laughs> since he's been at the volume as well, a confidence mustache. Which, if you have a guitar and you can play it, you got to have a mustache. So, first of all, it's great to have you back. So, here's what was established in the regular season. And we know more than any sport because of the duration of it. Um, the, the regular season doesn't quite have the intensity of the postseason. I always say there's about a dozen regular season games that I go, okay, that one mattered. That You get them occasionally, a Saturday night game, a big TV game. So, what's been established? Wemby's phenomenal and could be a top five player in the league by next year. Jalen Brunson is a bona fide star. OKC is the best young team. And for the next six to eight years, those draft picks and those players, they're going to be near the top of the West. Boston's the deepest team in the league. Nice mix, mostly of veterans. Porzingis has really become a different player than he was five or six years ago. Uh, Denver's probably the best team, best starting five. And then there's a bunch of questions. Um, you know, one of the, I pushed back a lot on this and I've come around. If I had an MVP vote, uh, Jalen Brunson gets consideration. Jokic could be the favorite. But I was thinking about this, watching him this past week, because I really started zoning in to all the top teams on Luka. So statistically insane, could be your MVP. Arguably of all the 50 plus win teams, he has the weakest roster. He solved, at least for the time being, the Kyrie issue, uh, and and the Mavericks are the hottest team in the league at the most significant time of the league, right? It, it's, we know the playoffs mean more, but the last 15 games of the regular season, you really, you can feel who's playing uphill and who's playing downhill. If you had an, if I had an MVP vote, I think I would think long and hard about Luka. Let's start with that. To you, who's the regular season MVP? Well, to your point about getting hot at the right time of the year, almost everybody I talk to, that I trust about basketball. When you talk to them about their top contenders, everyone's got Boston or Denver, Boston one, two. And then the consensus yeah. is Dallas at three. That's the type of, of foothold they've gained around the league. Now they're respected as a team that is considered a legitimate chance to win the title. And you're right. I, I think they do have the most limited supporting cast of the group of teams that we kind of consider seriously at the top of the league. Now the thing MVP is tricky because typically there's a large gap in the standings between Dallas and Denver. It's like six games, if I remember right. correctly. Typically, when you see a team that's not in that like super high end uh, record area of the league, like 55 plus yeah. wins, typically it's because there's not a traditional MVP candidate there for some reason. Like it's a Jason Tatum that's leading one team, or it's a, you know, a, like there, there's usually a limitation there. And so then you look below that and you find your guy who's leading a limited squad, whether it's a Russell Westbrook or it's a, or right. it's a Luka Doncic in a case like this. The thing is, is like, as much as Lucas had to deal with, Jamal Murray's missed more than a fourth of the season, and Nicole Jokic has kept yeah. them right in the mix there. Jokic, in just about every major national TV game this year, has clearly demonstrated he's still the best player in the league. Yeah. So for me, like, uh, even though I view Luke, I put him second, I put Lucas second. I just can't justify the gap in the standings and the fact that I think Jokic is playing at a similar level, if not a touch higher, anyway. But I think Luca is, has a legitimate case, and I think you got to throw Shea in there too. I think Shea has a legitimate case as well. But yeah. I think Luca is going to win it, and I think he deserves it. Yeah, or Jokic, I mean, Luka excuse this me. Year. Yeah, I think Luca's played better defense this year. If you look at the efficiency numbers on defense, his steals, he you know he's never going to be a really great twitchy defender. And, and I would argue this: I don't need him to be. Listen, bro, give me thirty three a night with your offensive efficiency. <laughs> You know, like Steph Curry, we'll cover you somewhere. We'll have a rim protector. I don't need Luka to be a great defender. Um, you know, when you have Giannis's athletic ability and size, then you're kind of demanding, I need the effort. Um, I will say this about Luka, that I don't know in my life, it took Kobe 
a few years that he was a more efficient scorer. He was he was a wild. He was like Josh Allen as a rookie quarterback. He, you knew it was there, but he was wild. Um, I don't know in my lifetime if anybody has ever walked into this league and 30 games into it, you said to yourself, and I'm maybe maybe it was Kareem. This is before my time, right? I don't really remember when he broke in with Milwaukee. I didn't watch sports till like 72, 73, 71, the Bucs won the title. I don't know if I've ever seen a player walk in and by the all-star break of the first year, I remember saying like, is he going to be a top five scorer ever? Like he reminds me, like, obviously he's not highly vertical. I don't know if he, I'm, I'm talking Jordan, LeBron, everybody. Is he maybe the greatest scorer, the most unstoppable scorer? He gets any shot he wants every time down the floor. It's almost his girth, <laughs> his lack. You know, he's he's not D Wade when you look at him. He's at times puffy. I don't know how to describe him. He is just an automatic bucket, always gets at shots. Um, I don't even know what his comp is. What is his comp? So honestly, like when it comes to his size, the guy he reminds me the most of is LeBron. And I know that they don't have a ton of similarities in their actual play style. Right. But the main thing is, and this is actually something we're going to talk about when we get to the Lakers, but like when you try to ball pressure big players, that plays right into their advantage. Like if you get physical with me and I have a size advantage on you, I can pivot, use angles to go right around you because I'm just bigger and I'm stronger. And so a lot of times, like if you ball pressure Luca, he's just going right around you and getting to the basket. And so really what's kind of taken his game to the next level this year is he used to be kind of like a mediocre pull-up three-point shooter. Yeah, he had some hot streaks against the Clippers in the postseason, but for the majority of his career, he was a low 30% guy on that little step-back three that he likes to take, right? This season, he's shooting just shy of 40% on that shot. He's hitting that at an extremely high rate. And yeah. so you can't press him because he's too big and he'll just go right around you. But if you play off of him, he almost like tricks you by just leaning back a little bit and he can get just enough separation to get that three-point shot over the top of you. And he's hitting it at damn near 40%. And so that's just put everybody in a bind. And so we were getting career high points per game, career high assists per game, career high pull-up three-point shooting percentage, career high pull-up jump shooting percentage. Like he's just hitting these marks that he wasn't hitting early in his career in terms of scoring efficiency to match his volume. And that's just put him in a different stratosphere as a player. Now for a segment called making it look easy with Morgan and Morgan America's largest injury law firm, the Boston Celtics this year made it look really easy. Not only the most blowout wins, the best record in the NBA, greatest point differential, uh, winning a league best 64 games in this league. If you go in 50 plus games, you've had a hell of a season. Celtics at 64. Morgan & Morgan also makes it look easy. America's injury law firm of note, biggest in the country, 100 offices nationwide, 1,000 lawyers and more, $20 billion billion recovered, over 500,000 clients through the years. Morgan & Morgan has a proven track record of fighting for you for a fair and reasonable compensation. If you're ever injured, go to 4 thepeoplecom slash Colin, 4 thepeoplecom slash Colin or dial Pound law, pound five, two, nine. That's for the people.com slash Colin or pound law five, two, nine from your cell. Winning in the NBA is hard. Submitting an injury claim with Morgan and Morgan. It's easy. Now, if you go look in recent years, players that have his ball usage, like a James Harden, it just doesn't work. You just, you do get to a point where you've played 95 games. This is a taxing league. And now, Playoff basketball is much more physical. You play more minutes. They're all hard minutes. You know, Harden could never break through. You know, I, I, and my takeaway is if you're going to break through, if you're Luca, it's going to be in the next six years. It's going to be in your prime. It's like 23 to 29 when you can put in these insane numbers. But do you worry about that? Because we do have a history that like players that came into the league like Kobe had to be like, they had to figure it out. Like you just can't play like this all the time when the ball usage numbers are through the roof. I think it's more it's less about it's less about Luca's usage as a choice and more about necessity. Like he hasn't really 
this this with Kyrie Irving because Jalen Brunson when he was with the Mavs was not the same level that we think of now like obviously you right. and I are both huge Jalen Brunson fans and he was good when he was with Dallas he was actually one of the few guys that was kind of reliable in that 2022 playoff run when they went to the Western Conference Finals but they Kyrie's the first guy he's played with that's like a legitimate number two and so he's getting more spot up right. opportunities they're playing with more pace he's operating off the ball more they're running more sets to get guys into into uh, advantage situations they're kind of playing a more team style of basketball Kyrie just missed a lot of time this year. And while he was out, Luca bumped up his usage right. the way that he typically does. Yep. But like the truth of the matter is like, I've, I've always looked at Luca as a guy who's just a winner and a savage competitor and a guy that would make the requisite adjustments as time goes on. He'll play on more talented teams in his career. Like you just mentioned at the start of the show, right. this is not necessarily the most talented offensive roster in the league in terms of ball handling. So like there will be a point in his career where he's going to have to legitimately share the load. And I expect him to do that. Well, a lot of times, we put a circumstance on a player when really the player is just doing what he has to do to thrive in a circumstance. Right, right, right. We saw Jokic do that. Luca did that when the when. Yeah, I mean, both Luca and Jokic this year had injured co-stars. Mm -hmm. You know, they had to carry the load. Um, let's go to the Lakers. So I went and watched them in person, and I, I like to go watch. I wanted to go watch Jalen Brunson in person. I wanted to see Jason Tatum in person. So I look at the schedule. I wanted to see. I thought it maybe the last time I saw the, the Warriors. You know. You know, Clay, Steph, uh, and Draymond play, although Clay is he's gonna earn some money somewhere. He had a really good April. And you know, it really hit me watching them is that when the Lakers made that Russell Westbrook move and had to get out of it, you can't get everything when you're desperate. You can get something. So they got size, but they didn't get any shot creators. Austin Reeves was already there. LeBron was already there. And I tend to give coaches a little pass on their rotation much like a defensive coach in the nfl sometimes darvin ham is a is a little tone deaf offensively like when you when you don't have lebron and austin both on the floor there's not a lot of shot creation you just need ad to be great and so the game i went to he did that he had uh, ad didn't play austin and lebron at one point were off the floor and it's like bro <laughs> Delo kind of waits for you to get him a shot Th this this roster has no shot creators and I do think that will be the Lakers undoing is that LeBron at this age, you can't ask him to play 40 minutes of shot creation. And they're, this team is long. Um, they're good. It's a good basketball team. I mean, like the first half against the Pelicans, they were all playoff focused. Like they were all playing playoff basketball. You're like, okay, they are taking the Pelicans to, I mean, it was just a physical mismatch. They made New Orleans work for every shot. They were getting great passing, great ball movement. But when I do look at the Lakers, I think to myself, you you can't ask a guy in year 21 to be the shot creator, the playmaker. And to me, it won't be Darvin Ham. It's just it's a roster reality, isn't it? So the roster realities are the are the main genesis of my take surrounding the Lakers as a playoff threat. And I felt the exact same about the Lakers as a playoff threat basically all season. Their position in the standings is Darvin Ham's fault. And to put it simply, they were three and ten in the thirteen games after the in-season tournament. Over that span, Darvin Ham was playing Cam Reddish and Torian Prince fifty-nine point two minutes per game. And when when they signed Torian Prince, I was excited. I like Torian Prince. I think he's a solid rotational wing. He's like their eighth best player. And Darvin Ham was playing right. him massive minutes and starting him yeah. every single game over Rui Hachimura, who's a better basketball yeah. player. Cam Reddish. Right. There was never, ever a case for him to be used the way he was. And in a league where everyone's talented and the margins are pretty small and the Lakers were kind of a little relaxed post it winning the in-season tournament, they toasted some games off in that span when they yeah. when they probably shouldn't have because Darvin Ham was kind of galaxy branding the rotation. But you're right. The limitations of the Lakers are the limitations of the Lakers. That, that was a standings-related issue. They should not have to yeah. go to New Orleans on Tuesday and win a game, but they do right. because of that stretch. As far as the, the the playoff setting goes, like the main issue is when they run into specific types of matchups, specifically teams that bring real perimeter strength and length. And by the way, the Pelicans are one of these teams. The they yeah. they they can handle D'Lo. They can handle Austin. Just LeBron is too big for all of those dudes. And when we talked about it earlier, right. you ball pressure LeBron. He can handle that because he's strong. And then the Pelicans are a turnover forcing aggressive like forward attacking defense 
And so if you can get the ball behind it with high level playmaking, you can pick them apart. The Lakers won the first half points in the paint battle 50 to 12 in that game. That goes to show you just how crazy <laughs> LeBron and AD shutting down Zion. And then on the other end of the floor, LeBron picking apart their aggressive attacking defense just allowed the Lakers to kind of pick them apart. But those specific types of matchups, those lankier wings, they can give D'Lo and Austin problems. And then right. that puts too much on LeBron. Because the Lakers are actually a very good offense. They're third in offense since January 7th. That's a 46-game sample size. They're a very good offense, but it's very much everyone's involved. They get a ton of assists. It's lots of ball movement. It's so... They had a ton of assists yeah, the other it's, night. It's, yeah, it's yeah, so today. bizarre yeah. watching them compared to last year. Because like there's a good chance they face Denver in the first round again. And we're going to yeah. pick Denver. But they could not be more different. Last year, they were a four-out, one-in, brute force, spread, pick-and-roll, post-up offense that was very defensively minded. Now, they're actually this super high-powered spread five-out offense, and they can't defend. <laughs> like, so it's like, a, it's like a completely different Laker team that we're running into, but they have the same problem. They keep the Nuggets close, and then the Nuggets out-execute them at the end of the game. So they're more or less in the same situation, but they are a different team than they were last year. So a team that, um, you know, first round Denver is going to take on Phoenix and Phoenix, neither team has a ton of depth, but Phoenix has been my disappointment in the league. I thought they were a team that would in, in a, in kind of a passive, um, regular season league, I thought they'd just shoot their way to a lot of wins and you'd have two of the three stars. Uh, Beal was hurt early in the season, much more than I knew he would be. But they have played together. There is some duplication in the offense. But it, it's years ago, I've said this before, years ago, when people were saying Katie's better than LeBron, this is when he was with the Warriors winning MVPs. And I said, you, you got to add context to this. Like he's playing, it's just go hit buckets. They don't ask him to lead, talk. He defended pretty well. He's always been a willing defender. But I'm like, they're not asking him to do anything. He didn't have to talk after the game, before the game. He didn't have to be the soul of the team. He doesn't have to be the the bouncer. And he didn't have to do anything. Just get and that's what KD does, by the way. He just he's he's a shot maker. He's great all time. But and I felt this with Kawhi. If you ask him to be a foundational piece, a leader, the Barker in the clubhouse. I mean, I, I go to the Warriors Laker game and Draymond, and they're out by twelve late, is barking at players. LeBron's a coach. And you watch KD, and this is the difference. And I've said this with Kawhi. When the culture is set and you add somebody like Kawhi and KD, and they just get buckets and stops, they're all-time players. But when you have to build something around it, because Booker clearly is not overly verbal, he's a scorer. That's okay. He's a scorer. And I, and I look at this Phoenix situation, and I'm like, they would be better with LeBron. This is just a guy to get a basket, and this team needs more than that. They've got guys, Beal and Booker, that can get a basket. They need, they need this reservoir of LeBron's sort of vision, leadership, this foundational personality. And so I look at Phoenix and I think, yeah, I just saw points. But all the good teams in this league, there's a there is there's a soul. Curry's a soul piece. Jokic is. You don't even, you don't even have to be overly verbal. But I look at Phoenix and I say, it'd be easy for me to just say, hey. Katie's been great, but this is sort of, if you're a top eight player in the world, this is your team. And I don't care if Booker was here before Booker wasn't winning for years and years before they brought Chris Paul in. he wasn't winning or a bad team. So I do look at Phoenix and say, some of this is just on KD. At times in your career, you have to be more than get a bucket guy, don't you? Yes, and that has been the primary issue for the Suns this year. I, I wouldn't necessarily put it just on KD, but like KD, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal, all three of them, they are guys that like when they're engaged defensively can be deeply impactful defenders. Even Devin Booker, yeah. like Devin Booker is not the most physically gifted guard in the league, but like when I watch Suns film and they're good on defense, it's usually because Booker is engaged and he's talking and he's like the communicator of the of the defense, like yeah. calling coverages out and that that sort of thing. Kevin Durant, like I, for the record, I'm much higher on the Suns than most people. I had them, uh, I had them fifth, I think, in my contender rankings coming into this postseason run. 
And I, I, I specifically love them for the Denver matchup. I think that Nurkic is a big body that can make things tougher yeah. on Jokic than some other people. Another key part of the Suns is they have the best, in my opinion, the best spread drive and kick type of team in the league. Grayson Allen on that weak side has been the best three point shooter in the league. He's great at driving closeouts. Because of the three-star build, you constantly have Bradley Beal off the ball or KD off the ball or Devin Booker off the ball attacking with an advantage. And so they can really spread teams out. And so teams like Denver that are like load up defensive teams that always defend pick and roll three on two and kind of load up on the strong side, that skip pass is open and Phoenix can pick you apart there, which is a big part of how Phoenix has had success against Denver this year. But to your point, they've been inconsistent there where it's like, I watch them, I watch them today and they kick Minnesota's ass physically from the opening tip. I watch them against Denver and they kick Denver's ass physically from the opening tip. And then I watched them against the Clippers the other night and they get punched in the mouth and they've wilt. And it's like, so that's been, that's been very much their identities. They've been, they, they're, they're like probably the widest range between floor and ceiling of all the teams that I've seen this year, because like when you watch them on the right night, they look like a bona fide top tier championship contender. And then you watch them on another night and you're like, right. these guys aren't made of the right stuff. And so like, it, the, honestly, like I, I, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, but I thought, I thought they demonstrated a lot of grit coming back and winning in Sacramento the other night and then going into Minnesota with a chance to get out of the play and, and, and killing them the way that they did. And in the process, sparing them from a Denver matchup as well. Like I, I thought that was a big time win for them. I'm, I'm generally higher on Phoenix than most people, but they've there, if there is a limitation, it's just, they don't quite have a ton of like physical alpha dog in them, if that makes sense. Right. Um, over in the East, I think I think the Knicks um, facing either the 76ers or the Heat. Now, who are you going to take in that uh, play-in game April 17th? Would you take Philly Man, or Miami? That game's going to be so fun because both teams are going to be playing as hard as they possibly can to avoid Boston. That's the avoid That's the avoid right. Boston bowl. Uh, I, so I, I think here's the thing. my uh, like Philly's more talented, but Embiid hasn't really played a good team since he come back from injury. And then uh, Eric Spolscher is definitely going to have some janky stuff to throw at him to try to make him feel uncomfortable. Complete and total toss-up. I Give me Eric Spolstra in a, in a toss-up game like that. So Jalen Brunson's interesting because he was a really good player with Luca. He was highly, he was an effective player. Um, and then he goes to New York and he's obviously more than that. But again, when you play with a high ball usage player, that's, that's understood. You know, it's like a receiver playing with a better quarterback. You can be good. Everybody can see your hands, your routes. And then you play with a Mahomes or a, you know, a, a, a top quarterback. And it's like, oh, your numbers all go up. So we all knew Jalen Brunson could play. Um, in the last month and a half, and I think this is a lot of pro athletics, is, you know, Carl Anthony Towns got hurt for the T-Wolves, and actually their pacing got better. Their three-point shooting got better, which is not a surprise because they had two bigs. Now you're down to one, and Gobert's not a gifted offensive player. Carl Anthony Towns sometimes can take the air out of the ball like a lot of bigs, like you, you dump it down to. So the pacing got better. So Julius Randle gets hurt for the Knicks, and to me it's like when I watch him, it's like, oh, they – they always feel like there is something in this league about, you know, you got to get Julius's touches. You, you got to get certain guys their touches. You're paying him 24 million, 28 million. Well, they don't give Julius Randle his touches. And that's more touches for Jalen Brunson. And I'm sitting there watching him and I'm like, I don't know. Like when I went and watched him in person, he is so much quicker than the TV gives him credit for. Like he, you cannot stay in front of him. You know, I don't care about Villanova, second rounder, grinder. He's not a grinder. It's way more than that. He gets great looks. And I kind of look at the Knicks and I think to myself, in an, I don't trust Milwaukee. I'm, I kind of like Philadelphia. But again, what what is Embiid? He had 12 games. Is that what he played off the injury? I, I wouldn't be shocked. I, I look at the Knicks. I think in the East, a red hot star, a good coach, and a lot of B guys that defend and play hard. I don't know. I, I don't think they'd get to the conference finals in the West. I mean, hell, Milwaukee's a 500 team against the West. What do you make of the, the Knicks over the next three so weeks? So I want to preface this by saying I love the Knicks. I think they have the best basketball character of any team in the league right now. They're super fun to watch. What do you mean by that? What that means to me is like doing the right thing on a day in, day in, day out basis. All the players are engaged. Everyone's bought in. Everyone plays their role. Their leader is a great leader. Never too high, never too low. They bring consistent effort. They they just do, they do all the right things. And I, I love that about them as a team. 
And there is something to be said about Julius Randle coming out of the lineup and that leading towards less of some of the ugly things we've seen from New York over the years. Because Julius right. Randle, he has a tendency, like, things don't go his way, misses a couple shots, he'll take defensive possessions off, he'll pout. Like, that's that's something Julius Randle's been known to do at times, right? So, like, there's been a lot of upside in the regular season. He's also, he's not been a great playoff player. Exactly. Guy. He's, he's really... Really in strong. Julius Randle's defense, he's had some injuries when he's gotten to the postseason and he's usually playing a little banged up. But yes, he's had a, a really rough playoff career to this point. Here's the problem. Like, I I think we both agree that like the future of the Knicks probably doesn't involve Fantastic. Julius Randle to probably do something it different doesn't. there. But, but strictly within the context of this season, it's this simple. In a playoff setting, you can really throw the kitchen sink at a team that all, all operates through one star. And there's only so much that effort and energy and focus and basketball character can make up for. And the main uh, stat to kind of like drive that point home is that as good as the Knicks have been this year against teams in the top 10 in point differential, they are 7 and 17. And they have the 14th worst point dif- uh, point differential themselves in those matchups. So, like, they play really hard. They win all the games they're supposed to win. And then they run into the teams that have more firepower and they lose. That, that That's pretty much the issue with the Knicks. So, like, I respect them. I have a ton of uh, optimism about the future. They're super well positioned for a trade. If they want to make a trade this summer, they're in a great spot. But, like, do I think they're going to go on some sort of magical playoff run? Not necessarily. And honestly, Colin, like the, there's another question should, we should be asking. Is Boston just going to murder everyone in the Eastern Conference? Well, I think Philadelphia is interesting because they have enough offensive firepower that, you know, if if Boston goes up 2-0 and they go on the road to Philly, Philly brings, you know, all gas, no breaks, crowd's crazy, win game three. Then you get a close game in game four. And the Boston is not a bad close game clutch time team. But they're not always great. They're not bad, but they're not always great. Whereas Denver feels like every big TV game that's close, they end up winning the game. Like every game, I watched the Minnesota one the other night, and I'm like, man, this is like the hell of a. It happened in five Minnesota. seconds. It was like it was tied, and then it wasn't. And it's over. <laughs> right. So like Denver's, and by the way, some of that's just championship yeah. teams. They just they just know who to go to. So I, I think Boston's going to. I think they will run through the East. A team that's fascinating to me, and I and I do think they could get knocked off by Indiana, probably don't, but could, is Milwaukee. So because of trade swaps, pick swaps, and getting Dame and Drew Holiday, they don't have any first-round picks. They're the oldest team in the league. I mean, Bobby Portis at 29 is the kid. So they're old. They have no first-round picks. The Dame-Giannis thing is not terribly efficient. You've got it. I've got it. They're a worse defensive team. And so my takeaway, and they're, now they've run through coaches. Now they're on dock. So you can't you, you can't go back to blaming the coach. My take is, what if they lose to Indiana? I mean, they got no first-round picks. They don't have a lot of tradable pieces. I mean, I, you could move off Dame. And again, Dame's somebody that has a market. You know, Dame is still an excellent uh, late game, late shot clock clock. Late shot clock score. But Milwaukee's fascinating to me. What if they lose to Indiana? And that'll be a good series. Much, you know, a younger, an athletic, younger team. What does Giannis do? I mean, Adrian Griffin, he ran him out of town. He can't run Doc Rivers out of town. I mean, owners at some point, that dead coaching money, it's like at some point they 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 lose patience. All right, the 82-game NBA preseason is in the books. Now it's time for real basketball. The playoffs. Don't miss out any of the playoff action. DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered. Same game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. All you have to do, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. You know the drill. Takes about 90 seconds. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Put in the code Colin. C-O-L-I-N. New customers bet $5. That's it. Five bucks to get $200 in bonus bets, and you get it instantly. You can't lose. Code is Colin, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. The crown is yours. Where is Milwaukee if they lose? What do you do? Well, first of all, that, I think this whole situation is a great example of why like, you should not fire your coach unless you know exactly what you're going to do next <laughs> because that can you could put yourself in this particular uh, predicament. 
I, 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 so before we look forward to this summer, I don't, I'm not ready to write them off yet. For the record, I will be picking Indiana. Even when Giannis was healthy this year, the Bucs went one and three against Indiana. It's a bad matchup for them. The Bucs are probably the slowest team in the league. And the Pacers are probably the fastest team in the league. So, like, it is a yeah. complete foot speed mismatch. They kill them in rotation. They kill them in transition. They, they It's just a nightmare for Milwaukee. So, I'm going to be picking Indiana. But let's just say, for instance, that somehow Dame goes crazy. They keep it at 2-1. Giannis comes back in game four. They somehow managed to advance. Did you know the best lineup in basketball this year to play at least 500 minutes is the Milwaukee Bucks starting lineup? So, Brooke Lopez, Damian Lillard, Chris Middleton, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Malik Beasley in 599 minutes this year, outscoring, te- outscoring teams by 15.1 points per 100 possessions. Awesome on both ends of the floor. They've been literally the best lineup in the league. So, like, now there's some context there. They've struggled in specific matchups. They beat the crap out of some of these bad teams in the Eastern Conference at the bottom. The bottom of the East is really weak, which kind of pumps up a lot of these really? kinds of numbers. But, like, it's not com- the door. There's just a tiny little crack in the door there for Milwaukee that that they might be able to swing through this year. That said, I am a, I'm a big believer in like when you've got superstars, it creates small achievable roles around them. So you've got a superstar guard. And I, for the record, you were talking about Brun- Brunson. I think Brunson's probably le- leaped left Dame as probably the second best small guard in the league behind Steph. Now it used to go Steph and then Dame. I think it's probably Steph and then Brunson now at this point, but like Dame is still really, really good. And then Giannis, obviously, still yeah. top five player in the league. So it's not completely outside of the realm of possibility that you couldn't make a couple of smart trades this summer to try to bring in some speed and then try to run this thing back. I think they'll give it one more shot. Now, if it fails after that, then you're in crisis mode because you better come up with something or Giannis is going to be asking for a trade and they don't have a lot in the way of assets. But again, like... For the same reason that Jared Vanderbilt is just kind of a cast in for the Lakers, but because they desperately need a perimeter right. defender, all of a sudden he looks awesome. Or Rui Hachimura, they don't have any yeah. forwards, so they finally get a forward and Rui looks awesome. Like you, you find some speed, a guard that can defend next to Dame. You find a, a legitimate front court athlete who can defend next to Giannis so that you can go back to Giannis at the five lineups and have some success. Like if they find some speed this summer, I think they could be right back in the mix. I want to go back uh, to a really interesting team, the Warriors. So one of the things I said, and, and it, I'm just throwing it out there, it's a reach probably, but when I watched them in person, and if you watched April, it was almost as if Steve Kerr was sending a message to Joe Lake of the owner. We know you don't want to pay Clay, and we know Orlando's going to make a run at him. We really need him. Hodge is good. lot of energy. He's not quite as refined. And you start watching them in person, and they run a lot of plays through Clay, a lot. And it's like, you know, coaches don't have to. And we, th- I thought Clay was washed last year, but when I watched the Warriors, I th- my take is when I came out of that game, I thought their their core that they don't want to move is Steph, Clay, Draymond, and Pods, and they would they would move all their size for a big, even if it was Carl Anthony Towns, is that. They've tried to – I mean, Chris Paul was effective. He, he's been effective despite, you know, mid-range guy, limited. I kind of look at Golden State where I think they experimented this year and Steph was remarkable. But Kaminga doesn't have a a closing package. He's just really long and twitchy and athletic. But you put him around the rim. You give him the ball. He's got somebody behind him. He doesn't have any package. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He's just talented, right? Like, and so – I think Golden State thought this year, my take is they thought this year was going to be better. And I look at him now and I'm like, not only is the dynasty over, it needs a huge swing to me, like a huge swing. Do you view it that way? I 100% agree. I, I as far like Kaminga, you put it perfectly. Like I, I'm actually, I'm actually really high on Kaminga's ceiling. Like people can't guard him and it like, they can't keep him in front without fouling in the long and run transition. Oh yeah, and in transition. Like, and he's also a pretty good on ball defender already. So like I, I I think in the long run, like five years from now, Jonathan Kaminga is going to be a really useful player in this league and potentially even an all-star. Like that's the type of potential I think he has. But like no matter what happens this summer, whether it's Clay goes to Orlando or Clay stays, or they decide to trade this guy, or do they decide to trade that guy, regardless, what we cannot do again 
is do the whole Steph is the only guy on the team who who's a high level offensive player. We we, we can't we can't do that anymore because like like right. to give you an example like in 2022, Andrew Wiggins and Jordan Poole kind of combined to be that guy, and then yeah. they both kind of fell apart. And then they traded Jordan Poole away. Andrew Wiggins has shown bursts of being capable of doing some of that, but yeah. not really. And, and again, it was both of them. It was always both of them that kind of put that together. So like, if you're going to go with Steph Clay, which I think is doable, you absolutely have to somewhere in that starting five, closing five, whatever, your five best players, there has to be another guy who can be a reliable night in night out shot creator it has to happen it's been way too long at the at the beginning yeah. of the dynasty it was clay because he was more springy and he could do do more moving then kevin durant came in then when uh when clay got hurt and kevin durant left andrew wiggins and jordan Poole kind of filled that void those guys are not in that void anymore and it's been a huge issue and like uh, the the book is out like part of the reason that golden state has struggled this year teams have figured out steph's the only guy throw everything at him, ball pressure him all game long, wear him down, blitz him on ball screens, do everything you can to wear him down. The other guys will probably fall apart at some point. And that's been what's happened. And like that Pelicans game was a great example. It's like, you know, Trace Jackson Davis had a really nice season and he's been a really useful rookie. Brandon Pizemski has been a really useful rookie. Clay Thompson's had a great year, but it's like when push comes to shove, it's like if Steph isn't making everything, they just they don't have an yeah. option. It's like even at the end of that game, the only reason it was close was Steph was sinking bombs from 25 feet with three hands in his face. So like at a certain point this summer, they've got to go after somebody. And the guy that I think they should be going after, let's imagine Luca starting on Saturday or Sunday next week, just eviscerates the Clippers and puts them to bed five games, six games. And I'm starting to think this is that's what's going to happen. Very well is on the table, especially if Kawhi's hurt. Because like, like, forget about the result of the series. Let's say Kawhi just doesn't go again, and now we're we, we literally his last three playoff runs that he got to, he couldn't finish. Like, at a certain point, Balmer's going to be like, "I'm done. I'm done with these guys. We need to go in a different direction." Right? Paul George, one year left on his deal. I think that's the guy. If you're Golden State, that you throw the kitchen sink at, and you bring in Paul George, and you make a run at it with Steph, Clay, Paul George, Draymond Green in the center. And, and then I think that team is like, I think that team is easily in the mix at the top of the Western conference. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, everybody has to be on Steph's timeline. I like Kaminga. He's not really on the timeline. Wiseman absolutely wasn't Jordan pools, immature um, pods is your classic play more than one year of college. He's not quite there. He's a good yeah. player. L really moves like, like Steph. He's just moving constantly. He's quicker right now. He's twitchier than clay, but clay is again, clay is just such a refined player. He's been in so many big spots and pods is just, you can tell it's, he'll think he'll see things and you're like, Oh, he's never <laughs> seen that before. He's kind of like a, he's like a kid that had like too many Skittles. He's got a lot of energy. A lot of it's productive, but you're like, <laughs> slow it down. You know, you're just not quite there. But I think he's been a really nice pickup for them. And I do think he is what they view as like the replacement for mm -hmm. Clay. Yeah, I think I think Paul George, I've always been a Paul George fan. In fact, even the playoff P where he gets crap, his playoff numbers are solid. I mean, this idea that he plummets like he's A-Rod in baseball where it's a different player or Bonds in Pittsburgh when he was a pirate and he go to the playoffs and he was a different player. Paul's mm -hmm. a good playoff player. At the bottom line, he's a, he's, he's an A-minus player regular season, B-plus player in the playoffs. For the record, you play better players. Mm -hmm. So very few guys are, you know, Jordan's the classic, oh, he's better now. My, LeBron's done that. You're like, oh, LeBron cares. He's more focused. So I, I think that would I think that would work. I want to go back to what you talked about, Boston. So Boston is, and this is a trend that I'm noticing in the league. So they just signed Drew Holiday to a pretty, pretty big deal considering his age. Jalen got a big deal. Tatum's getting it. And Porzingis is locked for two years. So if you look at what Boston's doing, Denver's doing, kind of feels like Golden State's going to do eventually, um, Lakers to some degree, is that because the draft, there's two ways to look at the draft. It either gives you a lottery ticket, Houston, OKC. It's not about now. It's You're, you're playing the lottery. Or if you're a really good team like Denver, let's go get Christian Brown from Kansas, multiple year starter, come in productive day one, lower ceiling. We know what he is, but we're, we need 18 minutes a night. He has to play in the playoffs. So 
I kind of look at Boston and what they're doing is they're like, we don't really care about our bench. If Derek White's our fight, we're just going to keep these guys for the next two years. If we win a title, we all keep our jobs. Denver, the same thing. Phoenix doesn't have much of a bench. Golden State, you know. And I think it's a trend in the NBA is where we look at the NBA. Maybe 10 years ago, we thought, oh, the draft is about getting the next blank. And the good teams are like, no, let's just diversify our portfolio. Let's get a Villanova guy. We know what he is. He's 11 a night, but he's a grown up. He's been coached hard. And so I do think that's where college basketball and the NBA have an interesting symmetry. And that, that, that's when I'm watching Boston last week sign Drew Holiday, I'm like, they're they're doing what Denver's doing is we just don't really care about our bench. We're just going to draft an old college guy at the end of the first round. And your thoughts on it, it looks like that's what's happening in the league is that bench, <laughs> you know, we're just going to load up on stars and go draft guys from Villanova or Gonzaga that we don't think have huge ceilings. I, that's what it looks like Boston's doing is we're going to go three years on this thing. And if we end up not winning, we we have to blow this thing up, but we don't really care about our bench. I think it depends on who, how good your scouting department is. Like if, if I'm getting Christian Brown and I'm getting like Peyton Watson, who's been a revelation for them. I don't know if you've watched that six block game he had against uh, the Timberwolves the other night, but that was ridiculous. But like they, they obviously like, as long as you're getting, quality players with those picks. I think it makes sense for the most part because they're way less expensive. So for instance, like let's say you wanted to go after Dorian Finney Smith from the Nets, this deadline, you had to include a first round right. draft pick. You had to include salary ballast. He's coming back. He's making, you know, I think he was making like somewhere between 10 and 20 million. I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but like you have to factor that into the cap sheet. There's all these different machinations that come into play when you're trying to bring in a player that's a veteran to upgrade a roster. Whereas, if you've got a good scouting department and you can find guys in the late first round, second round that can be contributors, you can get them cheap. You don't have to use uh, salary ballast and it's the same use of the pick. Right. And so, and then there's always the flexibility of like, Hey, if we want to turn around and trade Christian Brown one day, we can, and we can get something back for him. People are going to view him as a prospect. That's no different than, you know, uh, like Bruce Brown or, or like, or, or guys like that. Like you, you, you sign him as Indiana, then you could trade him. Right. So like, there's, I think that that's a big part of, of team building now is like, you got to find out what your strength is. And if you have a good scouting department then le trust those guys to make the picks, right. As far as Boston goes, I love what they're doing too. Cause you know, you and I talked about this a lot last year and the year before. Uh, after Boston's flameouts, like, will they keep Tatum and Brown together? And I still, to this day, get questions from fans like, hey, should Boston keep Tatum and Brown together if they don't win the title this year? And what I've consistently said is, with them being where they're at in their careers, you are more likely to experience a game through their own individual development into their late 20s than you are through some sort of trade. And so, honestly, I love what Boston's doing. Boston is saying, we're going to get one in these next few years. Give me Drew, give me Derek, give me Tatum Brown, give me Porzingis. We're going to get one in these next few years. Might not be this year, might not be next year, but like these, these guys are still getting better. Jalen Brown could not score out of the post until this year. Now he's one of the best post-up wings in the league. Jason Tatum every year has struggled with pull-up three-point shooting. He's shooting better with his pull-up three-point shot this year. Guys are in guys are getting better. They're they're going into their prime of their careers. And Boston has basically said, yeah. we're betting on continuity. We're betting on these older vets. They're gonna get at least one. Let's lock everybody in. And honestly, I think it's the right strategy. And as long as they make sound moves on the margins to bring it. The other thing we didn't even mention for the young players that you get in the draft, they're high motor guys. There's not really a whole lot better you can do over the 82 than a 22-year-old who's going to play his ass off every night as opposed to the 29-year-old who's on a, a $12 million deal, you know what I mean, or an older veteran guy. So I, I do like that strategy. All right. For the games that we know are going to take place, the series that will take place, we'll play pick in a paragraph. So give me your pick okay. in a paragraph. I'll I'll take the Mavericks over the Clippers basically because Dallas right now I feel I get more answers than questions. The Clippers, I get more questions than answers. Uh, Westbrook has a, been a very, very good bench player. But again, I don't think that's going to be the difference in the series. I just feel like I know more from Dallas today. I have Dallas in six. 
You're picking Paragraph. I took Dallas in six as well. I'd change that to seven if I knew Kawhi was healthy because I think that Kawhi is kind of a, a really interesting matchup for Luka. Um, kind of he can bring uh, a force Luka to call it ball screens, which can cause some problems for the back end of Dallas's offense. I think the series ends with the the Mavericks going small with Kleba and PJ Washington on the floor together. They've been killing teams with those two guys. I think Dallas goes small and wins it. I got him in six. Okay, I'll take Minnesota to beat Phoenix. I think it's a six-game series. Um, I don't really know exactly. I, I watched actually a lot of Phoenix and a little of Minnesota. But I do think Minnesota, they've done, they've been too consistently good to flame out in the first round. And when I watch Minnesota, and maybe the analytics tell me something different, but I feel like I kind of get the same team when I watch them play. Their highs, lows, I kind of feel like I get effort. I get rim protection. I get Ant's production. I get Conley's brain power. I always feel they're prepared and well-coached. With Phoenix, there's good nights, and then they trail 35 to 4 at home to the Clippers. And so I think Minnesota is a consistent team with a little bit of a ceiling. I think I take Minnesota in six, picking a pair. I'm taking Phoenix in six. Uh, I'm really excited to watch today's game because very rarely do you get like a must win game to sample when you're prepping for a series where it's like we get to actually watch 48 minutes of the Wolves and Suns going at it, actually trying to win. So that's going to be a really, a really uh, good film session tomorrow. Main thing that stands out to me though, that the Suns shot super well. They got 1.76 points per catch and shoot jump shot in that win over the Wolves today. So they definitely shot really, really well. Here's why I'm low on Minnesota, though. It's really simple. They are one of the worst offenses in the league when you get into late game situations because Anthony Edwards is 22 years old and nobody else on the team can really consistently generate great shots. And so it's a lot of iffy decisions. It's Ant settling for pull-up jump shots. And then weirdly enough, their defense falls apart. For as good of a defense as they've been, their defense falls apart in clutch situations because of the fact that Mike Conley's on the floor, Carl Towns is on the floor. You can find entry points to get their defense in rotation. And then it doesn't matter if Rudy Gobert's at the rim, if he's chasing some guy off the three-point line in a drive and kick situation. I think the Suns are going to spread him out and get better shots. I think they'll be able to slow down Minnesota's offense in the half court. So I'm picking Phoenix in six. Let's go East Cleveland and Orlando. Orlando is maybe a little bit like the OKC of the West. Young, um, really rising quickly. Uh, my guy Jalen Suggs uh, is an improved player. Like a lot of people had him as a bust early last year. So um, Cleveland's been weird. Cleveland's going through something. I think I'd still take the Cavs. Um, I don't know. I That could be a seven-game series. My pick and paragraph, Cleveland and seven. Something's wrong with them. What's your pick Dude, and these, paragraph? These series are always tough to pick when everyone involved is so young and unexperienced that it's like so up in the air personnel favors Orlando. Orlando is an awesome offensive rebounding team. That is how New York beat Cleveland last year. They killed them on the offensive glass. Also Cleveland is one of the most high volume pick and roll teams in the league. And your guy, Jalen Suggs might be the best guard defender in the league. And so Donovan Mitchell is going to be in for a tough series with just an incredible individual defender on him. So all the personnel stuff points me towards Orlando, but Orlando is super young and Cleveland got embarrassed last year and they know what the playoffs are like now. So I expect a lot of fight from them. I'm going to go long series and gut check. I'm just going to say magic, but we'll see after I watch some film. Milwaukee over Indiana. I think it's, uh, contrasting styles. Again, two of the three best players are Milwaukee. They'll probably get, because it's a veteran team, they'll get the veteran team whistle. Uh, a little more manipulation from a Lopez and a Giannis and a Dame with the officials. It's one of these, like, this will be a series. My prediction is when it's over, Indiana will be like, you don't like us. We're a small <laughs> market team. We got a job by the refs. But these older teams are pretty good. Like the Clippers will be good in these situations. I'm going to take Milwaukee in six. What's your what's your? I thought? would take Milwaukee in seven if I knew Giannis was healthy. With Giannis being out, I just don't think the Bucs are a very good team. And if he misses three games in this series, it's possible that Indiana could be up 2-1 with a game at home. 
you know, before Giannis even comes at, comes back. So like with Giannis being out, I think the safe bet is Indiana. But if like Giannis plays and he's healthy, like I think I would probably lean slightly towards Milwaukee. I'd pick Milwaukee in seven. So um, I, I'm I'm really interested in a lot of the, I mean, the, like Milwaukee losing early is fascinating. Steve Ballmer, I thought when he brought Harden over, I was talking to Lawrence Frank about this. I bumped into him at dinner about a month ago. And I said, I thought the Harden thing was just for the arena. I'm like, you know, he's an L.A. guy. Westbrook's an L.A. guy. Paul George, quite. it's like L.A. guys opening the new arena. And I'm like, he's actually, you guys have been looking for a point guard forever. He actually lubricates things. It's in Ka when Kawhi's like trying to generate offense. It's like, no, it's not what he does. He can do it, but it's not what he does. And the Harden thing sort of worked, but you get James's um, weird personality. Again, he's, he's an odd player. He's an odd quirky guy. Um, I think much like the Bucks, if the Clippers flamed out, I think Ballmer was an impatient investor and impatient at Microsoft. Am I supposed to believe as a sports fan now? He, you know, he's he's suddenly gonna be one of these long tarmac guys. Like I think no, I think the Clippers lose and it's they don't get a lot of consistent effort. You think they blow the team up? I think that's completely on the table. I mean, to put it simply, Colin, we could have four veteran teams blow up this. Just just imagine some of these scenarios. Golden State loses in the plane, which, by the way, Golden State, uh, even if they beat Sacramento, if the Lakers beat New Orleans, New Orleans has Golden State's number. There's a solid chance Golden State does not get out of this playing tournament. They could be facing a total rebuild. Let's say the Lakers beat the Pelicans, but then they go to De uh, De uh, Denver and just get killed. The, you don't think the Lakers are going to be sitting there looking in the mirror like we just got swept or the gentleman swept two years in a row. We got to rethink this. Yeah. What if Phoenix loses to Minnesota? They just went all in on Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, and Devin Booker, and they had an iffy regular season. And what if they get smacked by Minnesota, right? The Clippers, if they uh, if they uh, go out in flames, that could be a problem. The Bucks, if they go down in flames, that could be a problem. What about Miami? What if Miami loses to Philly? And don't forget, Atlanta beat Miami in a playing game last year because they couldn't rebound with them. What if, like, Chicago or Atlanta gets in there and knocks out Miami? Miami could be looking at this like, are we really going to run it back with Bam and Jimmy again when, like, we struggle every regular season and then we just barely squeak by and upset people in the postseason? Like, this could be because of how deep the field is, because there are so many good teams, we're going to have a bunch of pissed off general managers and owners this summer. That's like a guarantee. It's just a question of who. There's going to be a lot of really unhappy fan bases and ownership groups this summer, and it and then all hell could break loose, and we could have a bunch of trades and stuff. Should be fun. Well, we also don't have a terribly deep draft. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's not a deep draft. So, in fact, they're saying it's it, it's 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 that, uh, I think, is it the Anthony Bennett, Victor Oladipo draft? Was that was that the... That's the, the reference that, that's point. That's about the yeah. worst draft. And <laughs> in fact, the, I think Gobert... Was Rudy Gobert in that draft? He was late first, I think. I think he was one of the best players in that draft. I, I can't I right remember off the top of my head, but you're probably right. I can't I can't remember. I think that. Giannis was the best player mm -hmm. out of that draft, and he went like 11, 12. There were a bunch of good players that were deep in that draft, for sure. But the top of that draft yeah. was just awful. Mm -hmm. Awful. Absolutely awful. Uh, hoops tonight, Jason Timp. So this is our first. Uh, let the games begin this week. The West is deep. The East is not. A lot of drama with older teams like a Clippers, like a Milwaukee. Uh, all right. So we're going to talk a lot over the next uh, month. This is going to get really fun midweek. This was man. fun, Colin. Looking forward to it.